Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. It's been a strange year, I think you would agree. As the mists of COVID are beginning to clear, what sort of world are we left with? What does the political landscape look like? And what is the situation on our own continent, Europe? Here to try and work this out with us are two great thinkers from very different political traditions. Douglas Murray, who no doubt will be familiar to many of you, um, not only as an unheard columnist, uh, but a uh, author, a thinker, um, a star of many other YouTube channels as well as ours, I'm delighted to say. And his book, The Strange Death of Europe, um, published in 2017, was a number one bestseller for a very long time. And we'll be excited to hear what his thoughts are. And joining us from Greece uh, is Yanis Varoufakis, a Greek economist um, who was for a short but very consequential period the finance minister of Greece, uh, where he attempted to renegotiate the terms of uh, Greece's financial difficulties within the bloc. Um, he is also the author of a best-selling book. Uh, his account of that period, Adults in the Room, um, is also a, a must-read. So welcome to you both. Yanis, let me start Thank with you. you. Um, those months that we just mentioned in 2015 now seem like a whole generation ago, don't they? But in a sense, that was the canary in the coal mine. That was the moment when the, the flaws in the structures began to be really apparent. Looking back now, what do you see as the biggest flaw? What do you see as the, the mistake in the European project that was revealed then and that has since become apparent? Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Thanks, uh, Douglas, for uh, this uh, opportunity to exchange views. Uh, a small correction before I answer. The flaws Im appeared immediately after Lehman's collapse in 2008, because the grand uh, financial crisis coming from the other side of the Atlantic, just like it had done in 1929, exposed the architectural fault lines and faults of the European economy. In exactly the same way, way that it happened after 1929, it happened in 2008. And for reasons that are not too dissimilar, not the same, but not too dissimilar. <coughs> so what we had was, uh, after the 2008 crash on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, the, Euro, the Eurozone banks, just like the UK banks, went bankrupt. The difference was that, unlike Britain, uh, the European Union had uh, the Eurozone, <laughs> had the rule that the central bank is not allowed to bail out banks or states. So for years, between 2008, 2009, 2010, and so on, they were pretending not to be bailing them out when they were bailing them out by cynically transferring the losses of the banks onto the shoulders of the weakest taxpayers. And of course, the weakest taxpayers happened to be in Greece by accident, by a historical accident. Um, and so it was a perpetual concealment, fraudulent concealment of insolvencies, which came to a head when the people of Greece elected somebody like me to go to the European Central Bank of the European Union and to some, to some extent to the IMF and say to them, I'm not taking another credit card from you in order to pretend that I am repaying the previous credit cards. Yeah, that's what really mm. uh, made uh, 2015 uh, substantial, significant, that a government was elected to say no to the powers that be who wanted simply to uh, roll over an unsustainable debt. So, to, at, to extend the debt. so at the time, Yanis, you went all the way to the edge with what was then called Grexit, but you stepped short of actually taking Greece mm -hmm. out of the European Union. Looking back, do you still think that was the right decision? Absolutely, but I wish we had gone all the way to the edge. I was trying to push our government all the way to the edge, but in the end, as it turned out, behind my back, my prime minister had agreed with Angela Merkel that uh, they wouldn't go to the edge and that he would capitulate. And I found out later that that was the case when we got a thumping 62% of the Greek people, very courageous people, saying, no, we are going to go to the edge. But the prime minister on that night, um, he effectively... Um, overthrew the people. Uh, he had called for them, upon them, to, to back the no vote. And that very same night said to me, it's time to surrender. And I said, what? Tonight is the, 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 the time to push things to the edge. And if we needed to get out of the euro, fine. Uh, if we could have a debt restructure within the euro, again, fine. What was not fine was the surrender to this uh, 
permanent concealment of our insolvency. So I've asked you about Grexit. I'm going to come to Douglas in a minute, but I've got to ask you about Brexit because, again, I actually attended a talk with you in 2016, shortly before the Brexit vote, and you were basically spent 90 minutes bashing the EU. And at the end of it, you said, but of course, we must vote to remain. And I remember thinking that was quite an uh, acrobatic uh, stance to take. Looking back now, do you think that Brexit was a good idea? There was nothing acrobatic about that because I was not a supporter of Grexit. What I was saying was that I'm not going to stay in the EU, in the EU, in the Eurozone, at any cost. And I think that is a perfectly reasonable position. You know, it's supposed to be a union of not equals, but at least of uh, voluntary members who are in it in order to, to, to extract mutual benefits. And uh, membership is not uh, an end, it's a means. And when those means are leading to unfathomable ends, you get out, if need be. But I didn't think that was the case for the UK. The UK was lucky enough not to be in the Eurozone. Uh, now, to cut a long story short to answer your question, look, I was, as you, as you put it, I was a, an ambivalent Remainer. Um, I was ambivalent about my support of Remain, but, you know, weighing up the pros and cons, I thought that Britain was better off. The weaker people amongst the British population would be in the long term better off uh, and Europe generally, more generally would be better off with Britain within rather than without. Uh, but the day after the referendum, I could see that the problem were the Remainers because they were simply anti-democratic. They treated those who voted with a slim majority, with, but with a majority nevertheless, with contempt. And they went into a four-year a uh, long uh, path towards a second referendum, which I opposed. Uh, and, you know, my view was, we, we fought for Remain, we <coughs> argued for Remain, we lost, Brexit should take place. And that's it. So, and in the end, so you don't, looking at... So you don't now think, you haven't changed your view on whether Brexit was a good idea. You, you still, if you voted oh, now, you still be a Remainer? I think I have. Uh, watching the never-ending fiasco of the last 13, 14 months, ever since the pandemic hit. Looking at the way in which, yet again, our great and good leaders in Brussels and elsewhere managed to miss the opportunity to uh, do that which would be right by the majority of people in every country, not in a majority of countries, but in every country. Looking at the vaccination, the vaccine fiasco, the corruption and incompetence of the commission, I have to confess, uh, but don't tell anybody who's watching. <laughs> Let's keep this between us. That um, I've changed my mind. I think that Brexit, in the end, you know, when you're weighing, weighing things up, um, w w was probably the right way for Britain. Okay. Well, you've heard it for sure there, unambiguously from Yanis. Uh, let's go to Douglas. He's looking a tiny bit fuzzy on the picture, but hopefully uh, we can still hear him. Your critique of the EU has been very different from Yanis's. Yours is more of a cultural critique. Uh, and it also, I suppose, stems from that same year, 2015. A lot of your book was about the immigration policy and, and the large number of refugees that were taken then in 2015. What do you think the, the biggest flaw in the design of the system was? Well, uh, first of all, let me say it's a great pleasure to be with you both and with all the audience. Um, and I'm very pleased to have heard what Yanis just said. Um, because I think too few people have actually adapted and have been willing to adapt their opinions to the realities that have been going on. Uh, too many people have been holding on to uh, um, dogmatic opinions about the EU without recognizing that the EU itself is shifting. It proves itself more or often less competent at various tasks and that people's attitudes should, should change accordingly. I think there's been too little of that in recent years. I think if we look back at the last decade, a number of things strike me. One is the fact that if you said the great EU crisis of the 2010s, the immediate follow-on question is which one? Which one of these massive crisis after crisis would you be talking about? It could be the, the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis. You could be talking about the migration crisis. You could be in the last year and more be talking about the vaccine crisis. Uh, that in itself is a very bad sign. It suggests a um, bureaucracy that is, is not limber at the very least, is not able to adapt, is not able to shift, maybe even not 
able to compromise. Uh, what's more, what strikes me is that on each of the failings that the EU has shown, there are some similar patterns. Uh, uh, one of them goes back to, you're right, by the way, Freddie, I mean, my own major concern with regards to the EU in the last uh, decade has been to do with migration. Uh, but th that, that's not the root of my own uh, concern about the EU. My own root of my own concern was always, as it has tended to be on the conservative right in the UK, an issue of legitimacy, a simple issue of democratic legitimacy, the issue of um, who governs you, uh, how can you get rid of them? Famously, Tony Benn said there are five questions to ask uh, of anyone in power. You know, how did you get the power? How can it be taken away? And, and, and so on. I think with the EU, those questions were never able to be answered. I was very struck, by the way, when I was reading uh, Yanis's uh, book, Adults in the Room, recently, and, uh, ahead of this conversation. I was very struck by uh, um, a number of things, one of which was his description of the Eurogroup completely accurately. He said the Eurogroup most European citizens have no idea what the Eurogroup is. They don't know it exists. If you went up to anyone in any capital, an informed person said, what is the Eurogroup? They couldn't tell you. That seems to me to be a very sinister uh, uh, situation. Uh, uh, democracy has to be predicated on the idea that the public know who is in charge, who makes decisions. When they make a bad decision, the public can get rid of them. When they make a good decision, they can be rewarded. But that's, that's a fundamental issue. And somehow, as the EU has grown, uh, it has been able to evade uh, um, consequences. It's been, the people at the very top have been able to evade almost all um, public opinion. They have been able to uh, sail on without any censure of their own. And I, I just put one obvious example out there. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, ma many things can be said about him, the former head of the European Commission. How is it possible that during somebody's presidency, they lose one of the largest contributors to the EU budget? They, they lose the, the UK from the EU, and uh, he sails on. Uh, there's no self-questioning. There's, no, um, there's no apparent inter self-interrogation. This seems to me even more than, than the issues of the uh, Eurozone crises and, and the migration crisis and many more crises that will be to come. This seems to me to be the central issue that, 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 that must be grappled with is why is this entity so incredibly incapable of responding and adapting and, most importantly, listening? I just add one other thing to that, if I may, which is that uh, um, I do think that my own personal policy is that the UK has expressed its attitude towards the EU by leaving and uh, that it's um, ungracious of uh, British uh, thinkers, writers and others uh, to wish the EU uh, ill as much as it is for the EU to wish the UK ill. And uh, my own hope is that, as I say, we've, we've made our point by leaving. Uh, but that after that, we, we should wish it well. That doesn't mean we don't make critiques of it still, mm. uh, but they have to be critiques that aren't and caught up in a sort of desire for disaster. Douglas, I want, I'm going to come on to the migration point in a moment there, but Yanis, is anything that Douglas just said, do you take issue with? Or are we, are we still in the violent agreement stage here? I don't want to take issue with anything he said regarding the unaccountability. And that there is no democratic deficit, as I say, in Brussels. It's like saying that there is an oxygen deficit on the moon. There is no oxygen on the moon. There is no democracy in Brussels. It, it has been ruled out of court by design. It's a designer feature not to have democracy in Brussels. But I want, I'd like to, 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 to answer the question, implicit question in what Douglas said, as to why that is. Uh, and allow me to say that this has to do with the very uh, foundations of the EU. The EU was created, unlike the states, the Greek state, I'm speaking for Greece, the UK, Germany, whatever, yeah. Iceland. States emerged organically as a result of social conflict between different classes. Uh, the Magna Carta was a clash between, the result of a clash between the king and the barons. Then the merchants came in and they wanted their share of the pie. Uh, the trades unions um, represented labor much, much later on. And the state is an organic evolution of this kind of social conflict and a, a set of institutions, the purpose of which is to ameliorate these clashes and to find some kind of dynamic disequilibrium, equilibrium, call, call you what, what you might. But the EU was not created that way. The EU was created, remember the first name of the EU, the European Communities of Coal and Steel, it was like OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It was a cartel. 
It was a cartel of coal and steel. Then they introduced the automakers, the electrical goods manufacturers, and finally the French farmers in the Treaty of Rome with a common agricultural policy. The whole point was to limit competition between those large uh, economic interests, oligopolies, and to create a, um, a bureaucracy in Brussels that would manage, on behalf of big business, uh, this continental market, oligopolistic market. Right? Mm -hmm. That is hugely different to the American, the, 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 the British, even to the capitalist model in, in Amsterdam, right? Uh, and, and, you know, cartels do splendidly during periods of growth. So when the pr price of oil is going up, OPEC is, well, it was working quite well. Yeah? It's when they have to share burdens, losses, when the price of oil comes down, that they split mm. and there is all sorts of uh, uh, incongruity within. Similarly, with the European Union, they sailed uh, through various small scale crises until we hit 2008. And then they unleashed a majestic project of suppressing democratic opinion, of suppressing peoples like the Greek people, not just, but not just the Greek people. Suppressing governments even of the right within the European Union. You see, this is what cartels do. So the question is, for me, you know, uh, we are supposed to be discussing does the EU deserve to survive or not? I mean, who gives a damn? I mean, the EU, we should not anthropomorphize. The EU that neither deserves to survive or doesn't deserve to survive. It's a question of minimizing human cost for the majority of Europeans. That's for, for me, is the main question. Mm. And I very much fear. I take what Douglas says seriously, that, you know, whether you're a Brexiteer or a Remainer in Britain, you should want the EU not to fragment and to, to decompose, mm. because Britain is going to suffer immensely if that happens. Just think of what happens if the, the euro breaks down. And make no mistake, the euro will break down because Germany will leave the euro before Italy or Greece. That yeah, well, would be a catastrophe. For Britain. That sounded like a prediction. Let's go uh, back to Douglas, if I may. I, I'm keen to talk a little bit about the migration question here, because we've, we've, we've heard about the economic structures, but the reason your book in 2017 did so well, in a way, is that it chimed with this sense of something civilizational going on, or was there a question of European civilization? How was this being affected by the large numbers of uh, new arrivals? In your analysis, is that what perhaps, you know, amongst these other factors, but is that a key reason for why we then saw Brexit, why we then saw these populist uh, governments and, or movements across the continent? I think that the migration crisis of the mid-2010s uh, was, was an extraordinarily important moment, uh, but it was not the start of this particular challenge. Uh, the Mediterranean countries, uh, principally, I mean, most famously, uh, Italy and Greece, ha had been coping with this question for a very long time and had been allowed, I thought, outrageously, to effectively cope with it alone. Uh, one of the things that, that made the migration question, I think, an issue that made so many people effectively see through some of the problems of the EU, and not just say see them, but see through them, uh, was the talk uh, from Brussels about the common policy. But the reality seen in the uh, frontline countries, uh, the reality of countries being effectively left alone uh, to deal with this question. Mm. Uh, and uh, all uh, Italian and Greek citizens I've spoken to, whatever political persuasion, are aware that this, this extraordinary burden of how to deal with significant flows of people, significant pushes of people from sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, the Middle East and the Far East, uh, is a very serious humanitarian, financial, and other problem. Mm. And for all of the talk in Brussels, uh, the reality remained that, that, that the countries were effectively uh, holding this burden on their own. Mm. And uh, uh, it's only in 2015 that the reality of what was being expected of the Mediterranean countries was then having to be dealt with by the northern countries as well. And they reacted in a spasm and uh, a, a policy that was not thought through, mm. which they would not um, by any means repeat if they had the opportunity. But the demonstration that there was something fundamentally wrong with the uh, um, procedures of thinking in Brussels. And if I can give one example very quickly. Um, uh, at one point in the crisis in 2015, I went from the, the Greek island of Lesbos 
uh, to uh, Berlin in a fairly quick succession. And I was speaking to one of Angela Merkel's supporters in the Bundestag, who explained why the EU's policy was uh, was worth sustaining. And I said to him, um, uh, I've just come from Lesbos, and there are thousands of people currently stuck on that island. Uh, and they are stuck there because you have closed the borders unilaterally without telling people. He said, no, 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 they have, they have, uh, they're just not coming anymore. This is a point to which they'd slowed the, 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 the process down somewhat. I said, no, they're not coming because they're locked on the island. And he, said, and he kept insisting this wasn't the case. And I said to him, I said, look, if you want, you and I can charter a plane now and fly the thousands of people stuck on the Isle of Lesbos right here to Berlin and speed up the process. And he said, no, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, the case. And I thought, the simple denial uh, from the, for want of a better word, establishment voices in the EU and in Berlin and Brussels at that point, to me was staggering. Mm. And it undermined one of those central issues we have always heard from in the EU, which is the principle of solidarity. And solidarity is a wonderful principle, uh, but it's a horrible thing if you speak it and do not practice it. And the EU on the migration question for years had spoken the language of solidarity and had resolutely failed to practice it. Let uh, me as I say, uh, I think that every uh, has issues like that where they've seen. I just want to, want to go to Yanis for a minute. We, we're, we're trying to get your video back. We, Yanis, that moment that Douglas is talking about, I keep asking you whether you've uh, evolved your views on things. I'm sorry, it's not meant to be an inquisition, but do you, at the time in 20, well, at the time in 2015, you were, uh, you know, broadly supportive of the idea that, um, ha in one way or the other, uh, large numbers of refugees needed to be accommodated within the EU? Although you're critical, as I recall, of the way it was done, do you now think that was a mistake? Those large numbers coming into countries like Germany, like Sweden, do you regret that? No, not in the slightest. But let me agree with what uh, Douglas was saying <laughs> uh, by quoting uh, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, the famous uh, quotation, you know, when he was, he was asked what he thought of Western civilization, he thought it would be a great idea. This is how I respond when I hear the words European Union or European solidarity. It would be a brilliant idea, except we don't have it at all, exactly as Douglas says. Uh, let me remind you that in 2010, the bailout of Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, Ben Paribas, and Finance Bank, the fourth most of, of the most stupid banks in the world that w uh, went into serious insolvency. They fell into a black hole as a result of their trades of uh, subprime derivatives in the United States. They were salvaged by means of the largest loan in human history, in absolute terms, not relative terms, that was given to the Greek state so that the Greek state could give it to those four banks, to those four banks, right? And you know how they, uh, Mrs. Merkel passed this through the Bundestag, the federal parliament, as a package of solidarity for the Greeks, whereas it was solidarity for, you know, two German and two French banks. So they, it's not just that solidarity is not there or the union is not there. It is that they are abusing the terms, giving those terms, beautiful terms, a, very, a terrible name amongst the majority of people. Now, let me uh, come clean on the question of migration. Uh, I personally have absolutely no doubt that there is no such thing as a migration crisis, especially not in Europe. What there is, is a crisis for those poor souls who have to leave their bombed out homes in Syria, in Pakistan, or who, you know, abandon Ghana and Nigeria and prepare to you know, die in the Aegean, to drown in the Aegean, in order to give their kids a chance of breathing, of having a life that is not a constant nightmare. Let me give you an example. Back in 1991, when the Iron Curtain collapsed, uh, Greece was a country of nine and a, half, and a half million people, nine and a half million people. Suddenly, as a result of the collapse, we had one million refugees, most of them, the vast majority of whom were Albanian Muslims. They came into the country. Greece was not a rich country in 1991. It was not an efficient country. We were not, you know, going gangbusters. But we were not in the throngs, in the clasps of a major crisis. You never heard of that. You know, 10% of the population <laughs> came into the country. And you know, how, you know what happened to them? They integrated. Um, at the University of Athens, when I was teaching 10 years later and so on, their kids were some of my best students. I wouldn't even know that they were not Greek kids. 
uh, or kids of Greek descent if it wasn't for the surname. Uh, and Greece became a much better country. Our educational system was improved massively because we had a huge democratic pro problem because the of, of, of migrants. But, uh, but, what happened in 2015, and this is how I finish, what happened in 2015 was you had a defeated people. Greece had been turned into a debt colony of uh, Northern Europe. Northern Europe had used Greece in order to salvage its own banks at the expense of Greeks who were being thrown out of their homes. Remember, there were 600,000 homes that were earmarked for foreclosure by the same banks that were saved by the same taxpayers. Okay? So the people of Greece felt like refugees in their own home when the influx of Syrians, Nigerians, and so on came. So that was the problem. It was not a cultural problem call me an economic determinist. But in the same way that in 1991, you would not have heard of the refugee crisis. Um, you know, you wouldn't have heard of it in 2015 if we didn't have this colonization of parts of Europe by parts of Europe. Douglas, uh, Yanis says it, it wasn't a cultural problem and there, it wasn't a migration crisis per se. Do you take a different view? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we obviously disagree on this. Uh, it, it, it certainly was a crisis. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why we know it is because, as I say, it is, it is not a policy that the EU has continued with. Um, if, if it was such a great policy, the EU would not have started to shut the borders, try to beef up the Frontex uh, agencies and more. They haven't done quite enough, as I see it, as, as we speak, the last 48 hours, uh, several thousand people landed again on the island of Lamp Lampedusa just off uh, Sicily. Uh, and that's going to con that's a little hint of the fact this this could yet keep rolling as a challenge for the EU. Um, but I also obviously disagree with about the, the nature of, of, of the migration question. I think that, for instance, um, large numbers of Al Albanians going into Greece poses different issues than large numbers of Somalis going into Sweden, for instance. And uh, one might debate exactly what those differences are, but they are differences and they do exist. Uh, the issues with migration always come down to the same uh, two or three things. Uh, who's doing the moving, uh, uh, what the numbers are and what the speed are. And clearly the speed and the numbers at the very least of 2015 were unsustainable for the EU, which is why uh, a panic set in uh, from Berlin and Brussels, uh, even from Stockholm, uh, which meant that they, they, they pretended that they had meant to do what they did and yet haven't done it again. You can ha tell an awful lot about political mistakes by that simple question of would you do it a second time? Uh, and, and even a politician who's who's made a mistake once tends to not want to say it was a mistake the first time. But you can tell they think it's a mistake because they will not do it again. Uh, so can and, I ask, and, Douglas, you know, I, are you yes. are you happy with I mean, we you talk about how there's now Frontex and there's much more border control. And uh, actually, some of the noises just this morning, we had Michel Barnier, a, a potential presidential yes. candidate, uh, talking about how he wants an immigration freeze for a number of years uh, coming yes. up. And he's not happy with free movement as it stands. You know, in the in the year of COVID we've just had, the borders have been going up. The, the nation state has been everywhere. There's actually been a kind of nationalism in the air. Uh, do you observe those things with with happiness and think they are good developments? Well, well I, my own view in the last years is it's is rather amusing, at any rate, to those of us who've talked about the issue of migration, that we've always been told that you can't stop migration. Um, and, and here we are in an era where it's been completely stopped. Uh, in, I mean, you hear people who have been open borders advocates like uh, uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada suddenly saying no foreigners went out into Canada. I can't say I relish that kind of language. I don't enjoy it by any means, but it's interesting seeing it. As I say, that after a generation of being told that you can't stop migration by closing borders, uh, we've been told that you can stop viruses by closing borders. So clearly there's, there's some confusion about this. I, I, I'm not... Uh, um, I'm not persuaded, incidentally, that uh, people like Monsieur Barnier in his interjection this morning are, are by any means sincere. Um, he is uh, attempting to make a run in a country whose uh, views have hardened significantly in recent years. Uh, uh, we see a, um, a political terrain able to be grabbed by somebody on the right who hopefully isn't a member of the Le Pen family. There is very clear open ground in France to Monsieur Macron's right. Uh, Mr. Barnier may well be trying to grab it. 
Uh, but I don't think it's anything more than that. Uh, and by the way, just to make one observation that's perhaps rather obvious, but I'll make it anyway, which is that if Monsieur Barnier had talked like this uh, some six years ago, uh, Britain might still be in the EU. Um, it, it, is, it is quite extraordinary hearing the politicians who said nothing could be done about migration and uh, much more. Uh, then doing this very reactionary swing to the right. And th when they do it, they seem to do it, as Monsieur Barnier has just done, in this cack-handed way. They give people what they think people want, and they always just slightly get it wrong. So it's, it's very nice seeing Mr. Barnier getting something wrong yet again, uh, but it doesn't surprise me. Uh, Yanis Varoufakis, let me ask you straightly here. You complain about the kind of neoliberal foundations of the European Union. It's all essentially a no, big business no, no, project. No, don't put words in my okay. mouth. I use the word neoliberalism because I think that it's meaningless. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the idea that... It's a cartel. You see, it's exactly the opposite. Fine. Uh, Sorry. I'm neoliberal French. But I, ju I just want French. to ask... I have people that, that associate themselves with Friedrich von Hayek and Friedman, and they would not support a cartel economy like the EU. Okay. So <laughs> do you think... We agree on this as well. Though. Do you think that immigration then is there an argument that actually the, the free movement is really a capitalist yeah, project and that the reason here in london we have had greeks highly educated greeks in you know hairdressers and pret a manger uh, coffee shops in the past years is that essentially it's cheap labor for big businesses and that a true kind of leftist solidarity position would be much more skeptical of all of that in an outflow of human beings? <laughs> Most certainly not. There is no doubt that there have been leftists who have been lured by national socialism. You know, Mussolini was one of them. Uh, and others who have not identified with fascism have fallen into this trap. Look, look, this conversation goes a long way back. There was a letter that Marx wrote sometime when he was a journalist to a friend in New York discussing the Irish question, the, the Irishman mainly men who were um, pushing down wages uh, in the docks of New Jersey, New York. Uh, and usually what leftists in support of migration controls do is they quote the first part of that letter, but not the second. Uh, the first is a description that, yes, this is what they've been doing, the migrants, the Irish men coming into New York, pushing down wages. But then the second part of the letter where Mark says, but yeah, th the solution to this is to organize labor. And, and to have different labor relations, not to stop the migrants from coming in. Look, I'm a left winger because I am, you know, I, I'm, I'm liberal. I'm a liberal left winger. I cannot imagine that the left would ever want um, electrified fences as uh, uh, a means by which to support wages. Uh, and in any case, uh, as an economist, I can tell you, there's absolutely no evidence that uh, in the medium run, let alone the long run, uh, migration is detrimental to the interests of the local proletariat. But this is a long discussion we can have. Allow me to say, you know, briefly about people like Barnier, like Macron. They prove that the last resort of uh, those running the cartels in an incompetent and corrupt way is a kind of racism. They always fall back on it. And they always try to steal the thunder from the Le Pen's and the Salvinis of the world when the Le Pen's and the Salvinis of the world get stronger, not because of migration, but because of hopelessness. Look at Italy, for instance. Yeah, for the last 20 years, the per capita income of um, the vast majority of Italians has been falling steadily because of the policies of the Eurozone. Every year, for 20 years, Italy has been getting richer but per capita for the vast majority is coming down. Uh, and at some point, these people get mad. They get mad at the political system. They do have, Italy, does, Italy and Greece, we do have a migration crisis. The European Union does not have a migration crisis. Because Douglas, I have to say that, you know, you're taking that very short space of time of about four or five weeks during which Angela Merkel said that the Syrians come in, and you are making it sound as if that was the policy of the EU. The policy of the EU was always fortress Europe. We always had very hard electrified borders, not letting people in. It was only during this period because Merkel felt that there was a political point to be made by letting the Syrians in particular in, not the rest, right? Mm. And we've gone back to this Fortress Europe thing. It is the policies that have immiserated the many, especially in countries like you know, Italy, Southern Italy in particular, and Greece, 
they left those countries to their own devices to deal with the migration, we have very large numbers, and Lesbos and Lampedusa, as you mentioned. Uh, in other words, they, they, they have dissolved the very notion of a union. Uh, you deal with this problem, it's a problem of your own. And, 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 and let me just add this, I'm sure you know this, uh, uh, Douglas, but um, the, the, the audience probably doesn't know it. It's not just that they've closed the Greek borders to the rest of the European Union. You know, they, they created internal borders. They stopped the migrants from leaving Lesbos to come to mainland Greece. You know, I haven't heard of internal borders since the Soviet Union, mm. and which I'm pleased doesn't exist anymore. So this is what the European Union has been doing. And they are gross failures at the level of investment, at the level of unifying the European Union economically and socially, and bringing about a degree of social cohesion, translates into an adoption of ultra-right-wing, misanthropic, racist narratives. You can see this with Macron now. He's trying to steal votes from Le Pen. Douglas, we have a question which is directed at you here. Is Hungary a window into the future of the EU? As the questioner asks, describes it, increasingly distant from European rules and standards and being drawn into the orbit of China. What say you? Well, it, it's it's. I wouldn't think that Hungary was the obvious example of that. I think there are rather sinister developments from pe pe uh, pecking away at the external borders of the EU uh, by China. I, the much more salient example seems to be the uh, the case of the Chinese investment in Serbia, uh, which of course has been hoping to join the EU, and is, whose president made the most extraordinary announcement last year at the beginning of the Corona crisis when he said the EU has not come to help us. Our real friends is, is, is China. Uh, I thought that was one of the most sinister signs on the edges of the EU of, of a struggle that is, is going to be growing in the coming years. It's certainly coming down the road and which I don't think enough thought has been given to. The, the, it's definitely the, an example of the downside of, of, uh, of Chinese investment that it is also part of a political project. And I wouldn't like to see uh, much more of the EU or uh, countries that border the EU involved in effectively uh, an extension of the Silk Road. Um, mm. uh, Hungary uh, uh, has, of course, gone to China as well as Russia for vaccines. Um, and it may be what the question is thinking of. Uh, I'm not fast to condemn countries for doing that uh, within the EU. Um, I think that once uh, Brussels proved so fantastically ineffective, in the vaccine uh, procurement and rollout, uh, it, it's understandable that countries would have decided to go it alone, uh, would have decided to, to procure, and even certain um, uh, regions in uh, other countries in the EU decided to go it alone and procure vaccines elsewhere. I think it's highly regrettable, uh, but it's understandable. And anyone who would condemn it has to say, you would have to condemn a national government for trying as swiftly and efficiently as possible to procure vaccines for their populations. And I, I don't think it's right to condemn a national government for that. I think it's, it's what a government should do. Um, again, it, it has sort of echoes of, of what Yanis said. This is my experience of this conversation so far, is that we have these two thinkers uh, who have both been famously critical of the European Union, albeit from different angles. And to, I think, a lot of the audience, you're sounding quite similar some of the time in your cynicism about some of the structures and the motives. And yet we come to issues like the migration question and suddenly there's this drawing apart and there's an absolute allergy. You know, Yanis could not uh, bring himself to be in favor of those kind of enhanced migration controls because it would be a, a, it would appear that it would go against his values. What is your experience here? Hearing each other think, talk, is there any hope or any possibility of sort of grand coalitions of the future of of people from the left and from the right sort of uniting against the technocracy or do you think these divisions are just too strong let me ask Yanis that first well let, let me just state it for the record that i believe we should all have a dream that we live in a world where um, um, our children live um, uh, side by side with other children without passing judgment on them uh, from on the basis of the color of their skin, uh, the whether they are Somalis in terms of their ethnic background or Albanians or Swedes. Um, and, and they simply, as 
somebody said once, uh, judged by the content of their character and their contribution. And I have absolutely no doubt that, I'm sorry about that, Douglas, but the Douglas is wrong. It makes no difference whether you, the parents of the children next to my children uh, come from Albania or Somalia. Uh, I think that we've seen this in every country in the world where there, there was mass migration for many, 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 many decades. Uh, on the question of uh, agreement, I think that we can have an agreement on one thing, on one issue, the importance of democratic sovereignty. When I was having the debates in Britain in 2016, prior to the referendum, and I was often on the BBC, ITV and so on, with Brexiteers, uh, with whom I got on quite nicely, actually, unlike other remainers, uh, I, I would say to them, look, folks, you have one good point. Don't waste it. Stop talking about the great windfall that you will get from exiting the EU and the billions that you will be able to spend of the NHS. This is all rubbish. In exactly the same way that uh, the Treasury's estimates of the loss of GDP <laughs> were equally rubbish. Your good point, I would say to them, is the question, and I think that, you know, not I think, Douglas mentioned that before, is a question of who governs us and what legitimacy they have and what we can get, uh, how we can get rid of them. Because you are absolutely right, Douglas. I mean, we have um, Ursula von der Leyen, who is a failed defense minister from Germany that uh, is leading the European Commission only because Merkel and Macron had a meeting in a, you know, behind the door, closed doors in a room, and they decided that she would be it. And she has been the most spectacular failure in terms of managing the procurement of vaccines. And we can't get rid of her. The, the question is not even on offer. So we can, we can agree about that. But the question is this. And this is my question to Douglas, if you want. Why can't we have a discussion about creating a democratic sovereignty that goes beyond national borders? I mean, I, I, I assume, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't Googled this, Douglas, I'm not sure, but I'm sure I, I assume that you're not in favor of Scottish independence. Uh, if that assumption is right, and it could be wrong, I don't know. Um, I really well, don't. if the Scots and the English can Come, up, come to an arrangement, I have a union, I have a federation, which is democratic. I don't mind having one with the Germans. As I said, I really don't give a damn about the cultural background of anyone. Um, I'm very much looking forward to being part of the same democratic, sovereign demos, as long as it's a demos that goes into the democracy. The problem with the EU is that it has taken, it has kicked the demos out of democracy. Can there be a democratic group beyond national borders? Um, sorry, I, I, could, I, could I just say quickly, I can test what he, what he said about the movements. Uh, most of the people who arrived in 2015 were not Syrians by the EU's own count. And, and this makes a big difference. The incompetent authoritarianism that Yanis describes at the EU level in relation to the Eurozone is the same in relation to migration. You allow large numbers of Syrians in, they turn out to also to be allowing large numbers of people from across the world. They don't know who they are. I think this is an example of wild and reckless incompetence at an EU level. And uh, to paint it as just being Syrians fleeing at the war is not compatible either with the data we have or with my own experience of being on the front line during that crisis. Uh, Yanis asked, by the way, about um, Scottish independence, among other things. I just say this. Uh, I, I'm not in favor of Scottish independence. I'm in favor of successful unions. And uh, uh, the uh, United Kingdom has been a successful union, one of the most successful political unions in history. Um, the EU has yet to show that it is a successful union, uh, if it ever could be. And uh, p political uh, and uh, let alone fiscal unions um, uh, are not in themselves always a good thing. Uh, uh, it would not seem to me to be a very good idea for financial or other reasons if there was a political union a financial union between, say, um, Europe and North Africa. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to me, it never seemed to me a very wise idea to try to form a financial union which uh, attempted to, um, let's say, uh, flatten the ground and make uh, uh, um, German economic habits and Italian economic habits uh, part of the same group. It, 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 it seemed to me an unwise venture from the beginning, and I think we've seen that. Uh, there isn't any reason why political union in itself is a good thing. Peace, political harmony, harmony between states, absolutely. But I don't think there's any reason to regard it, as I say, as just simply a spreading out of political unions as always in themselves being a but good does thing. That, but Douglas, does um, that, can I ask on Yanis's behalf, does that mean that if the European Union had been more successful, 
you would have been in favour of it. If the definition is, does it work, there's no, you have no principled attachment to the nation state as the largest unit. You'd be happy to go transnational in these democratic organisations if they were successful. Well, 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 not especially comfortable with it, but uh, um, political uh, uh, unions are always unions of um, intent and they have to be agreed upon by the people. That, that's my, my baseline on it. Is, and if, again, I mean, it come back to it, if the British public had been in favour of remaining in the political union of the, of the European Union, I would have supported that decision. I wouldn't have agreed with it. I wouldn't have loved it. Uh, but I would have recognised its legitimacy. Um, it, it is this issue of, of whether or not people want to be in a union or not, and where the, where the government derives the power and authority from that is absolutely crucial. And that's the thing that I think people from across the political spectrum can agree on. We have run into a trouble in Europe in recent years because a certain type of bureaucrat uh, has decided that they are effectively able to pole vault over the inconvenience of public plebiscites, uh, that they are able to pole vault over the disturbing habit of having to go to the public for electoral um, approval. And I think that, that 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 issue of legitimacy, democratic accountability and legitimacy is the thing that people of left and right and everything else could agree on. I think we probably already do. There's an awful lot then we won't agree on, uh, as we've shown tonight. Uh, but on that principle uh, mm -hmm. of the of the of the uh, uh, the accountability of the the governing to the governed, that must be a, a principle on which we can agree. Uh, can I come in? Yes, uh, Yanis, come in. Because I want to agree with you, Douglas. And look. Um, this is precisely the reason why, as a young man in 1980, I campaigned out on the streets of Athens against the entry of Greece into the European Economic Community back then, and why in 1999, as a more mature economist, I was writing fiery articles against our entry into the Eurozone. So if we, you and I were having this conversation back then, you know, should we go into the EU, right? I would have voted against going into the EU, and certainly against going into the Eurozone. However, Saying that we should not have gotten in is not the same thing as saying that we should get out because of the di difference between dynamics and statics. So sure. uh, for Greece to get out now of the, of the Eurozone, the cost would be catastrophic compared to the benefits of getting in, which were very short term and in the end uh, flippant. Uh, so, you know, I agree with everything you said, mm -hmm. that contempt for democracy is palpable. And I try to explain from my perspective I called it a cartel, which hates democracy, why that is the case. But given where we are, uh, what do we do? My guide is the interest of the majority of people in the majority of countries, completely Benthamite, if you want. Um, and if now, let's say that we press a button and we dissolve the, the euro, suddenly there's going to be a north east of Europe, you know, east of the Rhine and north of the Alps that is going to fall into a dreadful deflation. The rest of the European continent is going to fall into awful stagflation, inflation combined with deflation, right? We will become the sick, even sicker patient, the, the, the sickest patient of the world. We would dra you know, drag the United States down, China down, the UK down. Uh, so how, what is the only alternative to the constant stagnation? It is for some of us who are st stuck in this cartel called the EU to struggle to democratize it. And this is why what I've been doing for the last six years as part of DiEM25, the Democracy in Europe movement, uh, it could be that it is a lost cause. But then again, what is the alternative? Because you see, it's not as simple as Brexit because unfortunately of the Euro. Uh, once you've created the Euro, it's not a question, it's not like 1992 when uh, you got out of the European exchange rate mechanism with my friend mm. Norman Lamont um, mm. singing in the bath famously. Uh, because that's simply you, overnight you sever the link, okay, you have a little bit of inflation for a while and everything goes back to equilibrium. No, you will need to create a currency from scratch that will take you yes. at least 12 months, right, in order, to, in, in order to devalue it. This is a nightmare. I was prepared yep. to go ahead with that. But, you know, it would be a major shock for the world. This is why some people like me, who are very critical of the democratic deficit absence <laughs> in the EU, are struggling to democratize this thing. 
without having much hope that we will succeed, I have to add. Since we're in the atmosphere of uh, political cross-dressing here and, and violently agreeing with each other, what do you think are the positives of the EU? Uh, did you find Remain arguments persuasive? And would you basically agree with Yanis that if you were on the other side of the channel, you'd still struggle on within the union? Um, I, I agree with what Yanis just said about, about the difficulty of leaving the Eurozone. I mean, everybody can see this. It's, 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 it's the most fantastic threat to keeping people in, of course, is uh, how hard it is. And I, I've, I've done it with friends and colleagues in Italy and elsewhere, how hard it is to imagine what that would look like, um, floating a, par a parallel currency and much more. This is, these are all very, very difficult um, processes to go through. That doesn't mean they're impossible. I would say, though, that uh, the, the, the fact is that at certain points, as Yanis knows very well in recent years, these um, ultimate scenarios have had to be contemplated. And every time they are contemplated, everyone says it's impossible to imagine. And I would just go back, however, to what Yanis said at the very beginning, which is the possibility that, for instance, Germany leaves this before anybody else does. It, it seems to me that within the EU, we have this, we have this problem uh, uh, before Britain left as well. Everybody is told that nightmarish uh, problems uh, have no solution to them other than the one that is constantly being offered. And yet it seems to me that uh, thinkers, uh, uh, economists and everyone else do have to work out what the and, and better flesh out what these lifeboats might look like. Because what we do know is that if uh, any country was forced out of the Eurozone, it cannot be done uh, in a manner in which everybody um, arranging that is only just starting to think about it. The work has but to have been Douglas, done. Douglas, can I, can I interrupt you just for one second? Because I really need to say that. I'll burst otherwise. Uh, I don't know whether you know that, but there was a charge of treason tabled against me in the Greek parliament for having that plan, precisely. I know. So I agree with you. However hard it is, I, I designed a parallel payment system and I was ready yeah. to press the button to get out of the Eurozone. But that was... And what you don't probably know is that this was... Uh, the, the charge of treason was substantiated by saying that I was jeopardizing the national currency, which was the euro. We will have to leave it there. Uh, at that point, we actually carried on. We had a number of questions from our live audience. Uh, members of Unheard can actually attend these discussions and take part, so do consider joining. The link is down below. In the meantime, I hope you found those highlights interesting. Two very different thinkers but agreeing on a surprising amount. It almost felt like we were about to witness a breakthrough. Hope you enjoyed it. We certainly did. This was Lockdown TV.